Hello again and welcome to this Bible study on James. James chapter 5 verse 16 to 18. Now the reason why we're only going to do verses 16 to 18 and I'd go right up to verse 20 at the end of chapter 5 is because <clears throat> I would like to use the last two verses as kind of a summary uh, as James is doing the same thing in verses uh, 19 and 20. So before we continue, let's just have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word again. It's such a privilege, Lord, and especially the book of James, where we've learned so much, where we've seen so much from your word. I pray that you will open up your word again to us, please, and allow us to take it to heart. As we pray in Jesus' name and enable me again, Father, as your servant to teach your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so let's read our text. James chapter 5, verse 16 to 18. This is what James says. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another, that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again. And the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Just up to there. Now, one of the commentators speaking about this word confess, now your trespasses to one another, this, this word of this idea of <clears throat> to confess, he says, includes mutual honesty and openness and sharing of our needs, which enables believers to uphold one another in the spiritual struggle that we are in. There needs to be uh, a mutual openness, uh, honesty. And, and I wonder, <clears throat> if you look at the, the church today, I'm talking about the church world in general. Let's talk about believers in general. If you look at their lives today, if you look at at, at at the conduct of believers, do you think they are really honest towards one another? Do you think that believers will openly just come and confess their wrongdoings before one another? And, and that's what James suggests here. He says, confess your trespasses to one another. That means to have honesty and openness and sharing of our, yes, our needs, but also our spiritual struggles and the, and the fact that we have wrongdoings. It's as if believers sometimes thinks that somebody else thinks that uh, there are people that doesn't have any sin. No, there's only one who was without sin on this earth. And that was the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone. Because the word trespasses, when it speaks about confess your trespasses, those, that, that word trespasses, but basically refers to our own sin, our own wrongdoing. Those things that we do that hurts others. You know, sir, this does not refer to what I'm doing to God. Because that's something I need to confess to Him. If, if I've done something wrong to God, obviously, if I've done wrong, something wrong to my brother and sister, then I've already, oh, also sinned against God. But this is talking, I believe, more about hurting one another, not doing something wrong sinning against my fellow brother and sister. James says, openly confess it. Be honest. Have openness. Share it with others. Because we are all in this spiritual struggle together. And especially those who are mature in the faith. Now, once again, people feel so vulnerable. They, they feel be that... If I share something about myself and I share that I'm, 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 I've, I've sinned or I've done something wrong to God's people, that fellow believers will take that and go and gossip about it. They will go and share it with others. But you know what? If I've confessed my wrongdoing, if I put it in the open, you know what? It's powerless. Then people can say whatever they want. People need to understand Everybody in the church needs to understand. We are all sinners saved by grace. And therefore there needs to be this openness. There needs to be this honesty. There, there needs to be this, um, how can I say, the, the, this, this kind of 
sharing with one another so that we can actually be there for one another as we go through the spiritual struggle together. And it's interesting what James says here. He says, uh, share your trespasses, now confess your trespasses to one another. This is not speaking about the, what we find in the Catholic Church. This is not speaking about going to a, a priest to go and confess your sin. Oh, Father, I have sinned, that kind of thing. No, this is speaking about one another. It's speaking about going to a fellow brother or sister. Obviously, in the first place, those that I have done something wrong against. Confess to that person. Open up. Say, I'm sorry. But sometimes I think that our pride stands in our way. Or sometimes we think that we've become so high and mighty and holy that it's as if we are without sin and somebody that's uh, in, in a lesser position, you know, that's not as holy as I am. They, they need to do that, but I am too good for that. That's what James is not saying. James says we need to confess our trespasses to one another. Now, this kind of confession can be about something that I did wrong to a brother or sister. Uh, it can also be when I am troubled my, by my own conscience. That's another uh, reason why I can do confession to fellow brothers and sisters, because then they can pray with me, because that's what he says next. And Or it could be when, when you come in the open, as an open confession before the whole church. When you bring your sin before the whole church. So it could be a confession of just, if I've done wrong to a brother or sister, it could be when I'm troubled by my own conscience, or it could be when I am doing open confession of my sin before the church. But confess, we need to confess our trespasses, our sins, our wrongdoings to one another. All right, that's the, that's the one thing. And then he says, not, not only just confess it, James continues to say, Pray for one another. <laughs> who, who needs to pray for one another? He's talking about believers here. All believers need to pray. Yes, when you uh, need prayer for healing, you get the elders to come. That's what he said before, and that's true. But here he's talking about all believers who needs to pray for one another. Pray for one another's needs. Pray for one another's hurts. Pray for one another's confession that they've just done. If somebody comes and confesses that they, they are struggling with sin or they've sinned against um, somebody else or they come and ask you for forgiveness, pray with that person. That's what James is saying. Why? There's a good reason why James says pray for one another. And you know what that is? He says that you may be healed. So this can refer to, to healing from a bodily sickness, just normal illness or sickness, or healing from sin, which could be the root of the sickness that I, I have. And, and that is the, the reason why we pray for one another. Just think about it for a moment. Here you have a believer who did something wrong against another believer, who sinned. Nah? And now this believer that did something wrong to the other come to him or her and say, I'm so sorry. Uh, please forgive me. The Lord has showed me that I've, I'm, I'm wrong and, and I need to um, bring it before you. I need to come and confess it before you. Can you please forgive me? What do you think will happen if the person that was, was the wrong was done to will come and say, yes, you know what, I forgive you, but let's pray. Let's bring it before the Lord and and let's pray. I'm, I'm going to pray for you as well. And then you just go and pray for that person that has caused pain and suffering. What do you think does it do to the relationship between those two people? I think it makes it stronger. I really do think it makes that relationship stronger. And that's what the Lord wants. The Lord wants relationships to be stronger. And now he says, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Uh, but he talks about the effect of fervent prayer. So when, they, when, when there's prayer to be done, it, it must be a prayer that is done without a lack of energy na, and enthusiasm. It's, it's not a prayer that is cold and lifeless, you know, as if there's no power in it. No, no, no. We're talking about a kind of prayer that is uh, efficient, that is earnest, that's sincere, that's hearty, that's persevering 
Lord, I really come to you and I pray for my brother or sister. And there's a seriousness. And we know that the Lord is there in the midst of people where two or three are gathered in his name. But it's so important that we pray with effective, fervent prayer. It doesn't help if somebody comes and says, listen, I would like to to confess to you that I've done something wrong to you. And then you pray about the Sunday service and you pray for the youth and you pray for the problems in the country and you pray for all kinds of stuff and you never pray about the problem, the issue. No, it needs to be effective prayer. Prayer about the specific situation. All right. So that, that's the kind of idea of the effective and fervent prayer. But then he speaks about the righteous man. And, and this, is, this is an amazing thing. You know, the success of prayer has nothing to do with the person's talents or the person's education or the person's rank or wealth or the office in the church that person has. It has nothing to do with it. I mean, God doesn't answer the prayer of a, of a profane sinner. God doesn't listen to those people's prayer. He doesn't answer their prayer. He doesn't give them what they pray, except if they pray for repentance um, or they repent in prayer and faith towards Christ. That's when God listens to the profane sinner. But this, is, this, this prayer that is spoken about here is not talking about the, the prayer of a hypocrite. You know, um, somebody comes confesses their sin towards me and I say to them oh, okay brother or sister let's pray and then I pray for that person and I have this long prayer or I have the short prayer or whatever and I pray and I say uh, Lord thank you for bringing this brother or sister to me so that they can confess I accept their confession da, 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 da. and then that person turns around I walk around turn around and then I go and gossip and I keep it against that person that's not what it's talking about. It's not talking about hypocritical kind of people. It's not talking about, you know, people who have a formal profession of faith. This, this nominal kind of Christians where it's just talk, but no life. No. It's, it's amazing that God looks at the person who prays and that person needs to be righteous. That person's life needs to be a righteous life. Now we know that someone who is righteous is someone who is in Christ. Now it's someone who received Christ's righteousness uh, by faith or through faith. It's someone who has who's been justified by faith. So someone who has been declared righteous. And you know that justification is just as if I have not sinned. Justification is Christ's righteousness in exchange for my sin. So that's somebody that is in Christ. Those are the people that God will listen to. And why will God listen to those people? Because he is the one who made that person righteous. And because he is the one who made that person righteous, he decided that he will listen to the prayers of his own. And, and this is not where James ends. He, he says... That person's prayer, that righteous person's prayer, avails much. And, and that word basically in the Greek means um, efficacy or to avail, to have force or to have value. So what, what James actually does here is he gives us an amazing example of this kind of prayer in, in the person of Elijah. Uh, the prayer of a righteous person has a lot of value. But also, it, there's force behind it. Why? Because God imputed righteousness to this believer. And now God comes along and he says, all right, what he's going to do is he's going to work through the prayer of that righteous person. And, and this is how James described it. Let me just read it again, because I think it's important for us to, to, to hear the context. He says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Oh, wait, that's interesting. Why would James say that? I believe James says that because here we're talking about a sinful nature. Elijah was a man 
with a sinful nature like ours. So James is not talking about Christ. He's not talking about by Christ in his, uh, how can I say, uh, in, his, in his humanity. He's talking about Elijah, a normal person with a sinful nature. And how God, when he calls Elijah, he can use Elijah to do amazing things when Elijah prayed. Why? Because God decided to do it like that. So what did Elijah do? And, and this is what James tells us. He says, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth produced its fruit. Now, now these two prayers that obviously three and a half years apart, the, the, these prayers are not found in the, in the Old Testament account at all. We don't find it there. But Jesus referred to it himself in, in Luke chapter 4, verse 25, when he said, But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land. You remember the, 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 the widow that Elijah went to, and uh, she could pay her debt, and she had enough food for Elijah and her son and herself. That, that's the lady that he's speaking about here you see Elijah was a normal man just like us but he had an exceptional calling so it wasn't about the man it was about the calling it was a God who called him as a prophet and what God called him as a prophet God declared him righteous God caused him to be a righteous man and then God used this righteous man that God called to be a prophet and that God used as a prophet to fulfill his purposes and his plans. And this is the way that God intended it to be. God wants to work in and through us. In us to make us like Christ. Through us to accomplish his purposes and his plans. And how does he do it in this case? Through prayer. God wants us to pray. Does it mean that Elijah was powerful to shut the heavens up? And to open the, the heavens up again afterwards? No, it wasn't Elijah. It was God. And God was busy fulfilling His purposes and His plans in the life of Elijah. And obviously in the life of Israel. And God was, was, was fulfilling His purposes and His plans in doing what He wanted done. Now one thing that we need to understand. And, and this is what people sometimes do with, with, with biblical texts. Is they read that and they say, oh, you see, Elijah was a man just like us. He had a sinful nature. He was declared righteous. I'm also declared righteous. I also have a sinful nature. Uh-huh. That means that I can now go around and pray for the rain to stop and it will have to stop. And when I pray for the rain to start, then it will have to start. Hmm. Love it. That's not what this text is saying. This is not what the text is saying at all. You see, this text tells us that God uses the prayers of righteous people who seriously and earnestly pray to Him. God uses their, 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 their prayer. It doesn't have to be about rain. This is not what James is saying. He's not saying that, oh, we need to go around and, and, and um, ask God to shut up the, the, the rain, to shut down the rain. Why do we sometimes pray for rain if there's, not, if there's no rain? We pray for rain because we, we petition God. We pray to God, please, to have mercy on all of us. But then at the same time, we, we pray to God because we know, because we have been declared righteous by Christ, we can know that God hears our prayers. That's the amazing thing. Now, this is where I'm going to stop for this week. Next week, God willing, we will finish off with uh, verses 19 and 20. Now, it means that we will basically be done with the, this awesome book, the book of James. And I hope that these Bible studies, we've done quite a few of them, but these Bible studies in James have been edifying to you. Now, I would like to ask a question, though. If there's a specific book 
of the Bible now or a topic that you would like us to, to look at in these Bible studies, please let me know in the comments. And then what I'll do is I will, I will try my best to see if I can accommodate um, the requests that I get. But also, uh, if you see me at church or you want to phone me, let me know and uh, we can look at it. So that's basically where we are. Confess our sins towards one another, our wrongdoings towards one another. Do that. Pray for one another. And remember, whenever we pray for one another and ever we, whenever we come to God as our King and as our Lord, it is because He has the ability to do far more than what we can think or pray. All right. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your love and kindness. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you've done for us in Christ. And I pray, Father, please, may your word be, as you say, a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. For your name's sake, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, until next time, God willing, I remember, say what you would like to say in the comments. And may the Lord bless you during this week until we see one another again. God willing. Bye-bye.